In this video, you're going to learn how you can use your design skills to build better relationships with the people you work with, and by doing that, increase your own well being and that of the people around you. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Emma Jeffries, and this is the So This Design Show, and this is episode 120. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the hidden things that make the difference between success and failure, all to help you design services that win the hearts of people and business. The guest in this episode is Dr. Emma Jeffries. She's an organizational designer with a passion for helping others thrive by embracing empathy. She is the author of two books and her current mission is to spread workplace empathy. So as service designers, we often pride ourselves for being the customer advocate. We have a lot of empathy for the people who we're designing for, but unconsciously by actually doing that, we're sometimes creating more barriers internally than we are breaking down because when we don't have enough empathy for the people who we work with, we tend to see ourselves as us versus them, us as being uh, the users and the customer's advocate and them not being the people who care about the customer's needs. So we need to fix that. We need to bring our empathy and our empathy skills to our workplace. And in this conversation with Emma, we're going to explore how do we actually do that? Even when you're in an organization where it seems that there is very little time to slow down and listen to people because everybody is super goal oriented. So that's what's coming up. If you're new to this channel, welcome. And if you haven't done so already, make sure to subscribe because we bring a new video on how to level up your service design skills by looking at the things you don't learn in service design school. So make sure to click that subscribe button and of course that bell icon to be notified when new videos come out. Now it's time to sit back, relax and enjoy the conversation with Dr. Emma Jeffries. Welcome to the show, Emma. Hi, Mark. Hey, uh, you're at the other end of the globe. Uh, where are you right now? I'm in Portland, Oregon. So yeah, definitely on a different time zone. So yeah. your afternoon and I'm yeah. in the you're morning. Just, you're just waking up and I'm uh, almost ready to go to, to sleep. Um, Emma, <laughs> yeah. some people might, might have read your books, seen their presentation, Googled you, but for the people who haven't done so yet, what do we need to know about Emma? Can you give us a brief introduction? Yeah, well, I'm more of a global traveler, not at this period in time. I'm a service designer and organizational um, designer. And um, for me, it's been a passion to really capture how design thinking has been changing over this period of time of 10 years in the books that I've co-authored. And also, I'm so passionate about people. I'm passionate about empathy that I'm really... Um, it's about seeing people as people. Seeing people as people. I think that will be a common theme throughout this conversation. But before we, get, so. in, before <laughs> we get into that, uh, I have five questions for you in which we call a rapid fire question round. And your task is to just uh, answer them as quickly as possible without overthinking. Um, okay. So there we go. The first question, Emma, is what's always in your fridge? Um, the first thing that comes to it, almond milk. <laughs> <laughs> Which book are you reading right now? Um, there was a book about, um, oh, was it? It's about racism and um, the inequities. I can't remember the book title. Well, add the, the title to the, the show notes. I haven't got to uh, <laughs> yeah. Which superpower would you like to have? I'd love to fly. <laughs> I've always dreamt about flying, so I would love to fly. Many people nowadays. Uh, what did you want to become when you were a kid? Um, a foot doctor. A foot doctor. <laughs> yes. Don't ask me why, but I think it was more inherited from my mom wanting to mm. be a foot doctor, and she never got to be. So. And the final question, what is your first memory of service design? It was when Tim Brown came to present at um, our university because Tim Brown went to our university and it was him 
all the other people that were like engine live work they were all presenting in 2000 or 2000 and maybe four or five really really early on in the days and um, that got me so fascinated by actually what are the possibilities with um, with service design and uh, really inspired to kind of pursue that after doing my PhD. Mm -hmm. Tim Brown hasn't yet been on the show, but uh, it would be awesome if we can get him here one day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Emma, so uh, we already hinted upon it, and I think empathy at work uh, is the thing that you're passionate about. Um, some of the things uh, that we uh, discussed before we got onto this call is... Uh, we have a lot of empathy for customers. Uh, we pride ourselves with mm -hmm. that, but maybe uh, we lack a little bit of empathy towards the people we're working with. Oh, <laughs> sorry, it's okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so maybe we're lacking a little bit of empathy with towards the people uh, we're working with, and I think. Um, yeah, you have some interesting thoughts and ideas around that and why that's um, important. Maybe before we get into uh, that, I'm really curious, what made you interested and passionate about this topic specifically? How did you arrive here? There's been many steps. So it hasn't just literally happened overnight. And um, what was really... Um, interesting was that I went to Brazil on a, when I did my international design walkabout and worked in different places and what I really really loved was how Brazilians were like so open and I could be free to feel myself like and just be myself around them and then through my work in the UK government I developed a BWE program which is about help and empathy within a team and when people were really moving through a team they started just to like wake up and become alive. And for me, that was a bit infectious because people were being seen and they were being heard and they were free more to be themselves and more laughter was encouraged. And for me, it was it was an awakening of like, well, yeah, you, could, you really need to be empathetic with everyone around you. And now the program is spreading across the UK government. And it's just lovely to hear all the feedback and people reaching out to me going, this was really amazing. It doesn't just change their work relationship, which is where it's aimed at. It changes their broader perspective of how they're relating with everyone around them. Mm. So if we go one step back, like what was the situation before you traveled to Brazil? Because you said in Brazil, you can be yourself. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, but that what, wasn't that the case before? How how did you experience that? Well, because I'm British, we don't talk about our feelings. <laughs> so in the sense of in that, in our Britishness, we, we don't have that opportunity. It's always when you go to a conversation, um, it's always about literally, it's about like, how are you and get on with the subject? And um, I worked in Amsterdam and I know it was very direct and that, and I got used to that. But then when I went to work with the Brazilians, it was just so much more that they really started to really understand you and take the time. And they wouldn't do business with you unless you actually really understood them as well. So I thought for me, that was a really an amazing experience mm. to have. Mm. And now that you know this and sort of have embraced this, what do you feel is at stake? What are we potentially missing or withholding ourselves from by not adopting this more? I think as, in really, as this individual, what I see is that we're really withholding kind of, first of all, ability to, for us to be ourselves. And it's also at stake is that on a team level, we always see empathy as this part that you do very much at the start of the process and it's in the double diamond, we're right there. But it's something that we need to do all the way through, not as one individual, but as a team. And if that team is able to keep empathy with each other, they listen and they continually collaborate more and they're able to like bend more for the users. So it's about if we don't do this and don't build empathy into what we do, 
as innovation teams, we really get to the point of doing less for the user. And there's another part on the organizational level is that on the organizational level, we are, I mean, COVID at the moment, there's more burnout that's happening, but burnout le levels were already high inside of organizations. And when we are stressed, our ability to empathize with you just goes like this. We, we zoom down and we can't really see, we can't see people around us. So it gets us into this mindset of we're doing everything, but we're not seeing the people around us and the impact that we're making. Mm. And um, so there's an opportunity on all these different levels to impact our own well-being and impact someone else's. And I think that's worth really worth fighting for, or just yeah, championing, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Well-being, that sounds something like worth pursuing. You mentioned something to me about the shift from being customer, having customer empathy or empathy for customers towards having empathy towards humans in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on that shift? What, how do you see that? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I've charted the history of um, design thinking in the two books that we've written. And one of the roles that we mentioned was about humanizer. So I, I feel like as a designer, you really come in and humanize the organization. You have an impact on championing that customer experience, but I also feel that you have a real ability to champion the really the, the human experience and often inside of organizations we do you do cultural development work but you do it right from the top it's about the vision values and we and they're very long term and what we tend to overlook is this human experience every day of how are we impacting each other how mm. are we um, showing up for each other and that's the part of moving towards champion everyone's human experience because if we are able to do that we do deliver better products and services that come out of us connecting better yeah. together, especially in a, a time when we are in a, a COVID time when everyone is really needing that connection and, uh, and going through there. And uh, you even mentioned something about uh, creating barriers. So when we're as the design community, um, putting ourselves forward as the advocate of the customer, um, it's really easy to uh, blame the others within the organization to not be, to not have empathy for the customer, to don't uh, that they don't understand them, that they don't care about them, and that's actually creating a bigger barrier than it's solving, right? Yeah, I've seen that in many different places because we are, we want to champion the user. We've been told we're coming in to do this work. We are, we are that person who is going to change things. But, and somehow in doing that, we really overlook the business stakeholders around us. And, and I've found that they are really the key to really making the product a success or not a success for the users. And if you don't have that time and space to, to physically listen to what their needs are and make them feel heard. Um, yeah, you just, you, you will always be in this, I suppose, a victim mode of why, why are you listening? Yeah, are well, we the only ones who care about the them. customer? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have an example where you've seen this transformation happen successfully or maybe where it failed? And I'm also curious, like what were the, success ingredients there if it worked yes i do so uh, one of where where i've seen this work is i was um on a on a team and in this team i was told um you need to go and find the user needs you need to go and find what their journeys are the people what are the pain points of the people and as i was looking at this um and the, and you, next week you're doing a three-day workshop this is generally sometimes the request you get and all the stakeholders are coming and all of the people from the different places inside the organization. And um, we're going to reset the direction. Okay. So go. <laughs> so I came into this workshop and I could really just feel like the sense of like, they're not going to listen. They're not going to be heard. And the first day we just spent that full day really looking at what 
their problems were and fully listening to them. And we realized that like services we were creating were impacting how they were showing up. And if we got to the position of working together through the three days and they listened to the users, so they got empathy with the users. So this, they started to see that. So we built that into the process, but the focus was on building this better relationship. After these three days, the stakeholders were really over the moon. They were like, we, we were here to really say what was going to happen. But actually, as a team, we realized that we really need to work together because we've all got different expertise. And they were quite emotional. because, And then over time of working with that project, about four months with them, more and more teams started to come on board. So it was a bit like a big ecosystem. And in this ecosystem, we were then more collaborative with the with the leaders, with the different ones. And it became a really good exemplar project for how things could possibly be done. And there was no more us and them. We were we were calling someone who um goes he goes up into he goes up to Scotland and he's got really um deficiency in sight but he would go kayaking and we would know them as people and like we need to see people as people and that for me was this like revelation when I was actually practicing um haven't had my Brazilian experience so yeah and then there was this movement from a me to a we which I've recognized in that process there are two or there are many questions that I have around this but let's start with the first one you you said that you felt upfront that people weren't going to be listening, they uh, weren't going to be heard. How did you notice that? What kind of feeling, what gave it away uh, upfront? I could just feel it in my body. It's a bit like that hostile situation where you sit in and you're like, oh, okay, what's going to happen here? No one really wants to be in this room, but they have to be to be able to work out what we're going to do forward. And I'm really kind of connected to how I feel inside and it just felt like okay we really need to pay attention to the people that are here and really feel heard and get everyone to get to that sense of feeling heard so how do you break through that because i think we've all been part of such a session uh, either facilitating it or sitting in that room and thinking what am i doing here and not having that recognized but but what happens then like how do you how do you move forward? What is the first step you can take to actually solve this? Our steps that we took were very much about, well, okay, just listen to where the users are at. Like as user, as a user researcher on that team, what I was actually doing was um, I, I had just brought the full, the full transcription. I didn't edit it. I just brought the full video, listen to them and that helped them kind of start to realize to change. But then for us, fully listening to the stakeholders, we were like, no, we're here to listen. We're really curious. We want to know your, where your pain, where you're feeling this pain. And we mapped that out with them. And interestingly, when we mapped out this journey, we realized that the user's pain was actually the internal pain of the company. And you could just see it as we mapped it out over the course of the delivery of the service. So taking them along in the process rather than presenting uh, final outcomes, insights, they have to, it helps when they uh, are involved and live through the, the data, right? That, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's one. Is there anything else you did? Because I, I think I know that good researchers do this, but still there, it, it doesn't, automatically imply that the st stakeholders will be involved or feel heard like i'm curious what are other things in that process that made it different from your in between quotes traditional design approach um we just took the time to get to know them like as, mm. as humans as i mentioned mm. we we went around each one and we kind of created a human bond first instead of rushing into the process of like We've got three days, this is what we're doing, and there's no breaks. And and taking the, just the time just to have that conversation and getting to know each individual one as an individual. And I think often 
um, when we get into this mindset of we as an individual have to deliver, which I call a me mindset, we have to deliver, this is our goal, we're not going to open up to someone else. But the thing is, what I found with curiosity, I kind of frame empathy as that curiosity of having a curiosity for someone else and keep on asking, where are they at? What are they doing? But also having a curiosity for where are you at? And if you have any boundaries in yourself that are stopping you from listening, become aware of them too. Mm. So it was more of an internal and in curiosity as well. Yeah. Mm. Uh. It sounds awesome, like uh, taking the time to learn the people uh, who are in the room, get to understand them. Uh, but I also hear you say, usually we don't have or take the time, which I also recognize everybody is really goal-oriented, wants to get their job done. How did you manage to flip that around in this situation? Is it just a matter of deciding is it just a matter of priorities is it that simple or um we we just took them on a journey with us i suppose and before they were always over there and in our mind they were over there so we had to really feel that no they're they're with us on this journey they have value to offer and we have value to offer so i think it's more of an internal it's not things physically you you do do, but it's more of a mental shift. So it's more of a mindset shift. And um, here on my notes, I also have a question about how does it feel for uh, the other group? Because sometimes you're seen as the expert who needs to uh, come up with the, I don't know, whatever, insights, ideas, prototypes, and... Um, uh, you're the expert and the rest is the audience or the judge or so how does it feel for them when you so openly invite them to participate in this process and create a we situation I think it first of all it feels a bit scary to start off with because they've never been asked I think that's if I heard that before I've never been asked to participate so for them to be asked in a situation when people are always told what to do from a priority structure, being asked is the first step. And that feels scary because they come into an unknown environment. And we also then have to create safety and psychological safety for them to be to be themselves and and then slowly move into that space together. And can you give an example of how you create that uh, safe space? Um, I think the first one was seeing people as people beyond their grade, but also keep on, this is part of the, the we mindset, is keep on prioritizing the people before the process. We know we've got to get somewhere, but we have to keep on prioritizing them, but also realizing that we have to know how we're impacting each other and we have to have an open and transparent conversation about how are we really impacting each other and and keep that going and recognize like our power and what we have to do in that. And it's no, it's not always on the service design shoulders for that to happen, even though we think it should be, but sometimes we just need to let go of our grasp and have patience as well. So what, what kind of grasp do we need to let go of? <laughs> I think it was one of the things that when I was reflecting on what you had sent over is that normally I would be going into the, um, into different people and I've, I've done this in different companies but I would notice after a while that I'm really holding my hand up like this and what I needed to really do was just let go a bit of my grasp because if I'm really like I'm in this me mindset of a really unhealthy of me this is the user and this is what we're doing we've got to champion this no one else is listening I'm not allowing myself space to hear the other person and hear people around me. Um, and that's where more creativity comes as well, by having everyone on board and everyone sharing. So that's the grasp I was talking about. I physically could feel it in my body and had to let it let it go and just notice where it was. Hmm. And But that sounds scary as well, because I imagine that a lot of people, um, and or including myself, uh, sort of derive uh, self-worth out of... Uh, 
uh, having fe- having the feeling that you can contribute something, uh, that uh, you know something, that you can lead a group, can guide a group. When when you let go of that, um, how how do how do people respond? How do you re- how did you respond? How did you feel? It felt more empowering. <laughs> Interesting. Because yeah. you've got more choice to, to show up however you need to for that situation. If it needs to be that you need to spend more time listening, you've got that option. Whereas before I would be in a mindset of like, let's just get it done. I'm really passionate. Let's go. But if no one's with you on this journey to try and make a better experience for themselves and also their user, it is scary. I mean, when I thought of that first, I was like, okay, that's, that does, it is scary. And I can totally hear what you're saying. But for me, um, that's when it seemed to really shift, like Mm. the shifting of the grasping, like just giving up that control. Yeah. And there is no point in actually moving forward when, uh, with a process, when the energy level isn't right in the room anyway. Like Mm -hmm. you can move forward with the, with the process, but you will, you will never get to the outcomes that you really want. Mm-hmm. yeah I definitely agree so I've seen I've seen a big shift in how I practice is more from um I would always see myself as this change agent and and in our book we said seven roles of change for design but I've more seen these roles now as an awareness agent of what's possible you can be take people to become more aware aware of how you're acting looking at that full human experience inside a room and take paying attention to everyone and how you're bringing them along with you but there's some element of you saying well if they don't go there with you it's not your responsibility Mm. and it's not tied to your identity Mm. but there's also another part for me of valuing another person's human experience and the and their strength so trying to get to a Again, this bit about the we mindset, trying to get to it even it can be hard because there's loads of biases in everyone's head. <laughs> trying to get to a playing field that everyone has something to contribute. And if you feel like you're an expert, I think sometimes that does get in the way of it does. having yeah. connections. Yeah. And I like how you said the uh, shift from be- feeling like you're the change change agent to creating awareness um i guess that also um shifts the responsibility from making sure that change actually is realized towards uh uh, from you solely as the practitioner to the group because you as a uh, uh individual contribute awareness and somebody else contributes something else and we are all responsible for making change happen Mm-hmm. yeah and, and in that group shift um we only have a certain amount of empathy per day there's a great harvard business review one that's about the limits of empathy so as a team like i can't be given all my empathy out all the time because you would just become low resourced and then burnout would happen so you need as a team to have that team to be not just empathy at the start as i mentioned but empathy throughout the whole process and that has to be a team effort. And that's what I'd saw in the team I was working with. Everyone started to kind of show up more for each other. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I was curious, uh, what does that mean in practice? Is, yeah, without filling that in, but uh, let's say we're doing a three day workshop. How does that empathy throughout by everybody look like? Yeah. So, in my, um, so after I had these experiences of, of build an empathy in the in I kind of took t- back time to reflect and obviously the first step is listening um which is all about how are we hearing and the next part is like becoming aware of each other's biases which is the how are we seeing and where are our biases really coming into into play And where are our judgments? Because we were never born with judgments. As children, we were like really curious about the whole world. And these judgments have somehow been landed on us about there's a winner, there's a loser, there's an us and there's a them. And and we have to be successful. So all of these things really come into play and we have to then start to really unpick them. And 
I suppose, and then the next part is going into that um, place of having difficult conversations and having empathy, but you really can't move past that first two of, because that builds psychological safety. And sometimes as in workshops, I ask people right at the start, what are your assumptions? Like write them all down. We all share them. What are our assumptions? And at the end, it'll be like, what are our assumptions and how have they shifted? And also they've always, always shifted because we've learned something along the way and we learn how our biases really color how we are showing up. And it's building that, building that in uh, like small, small actions like, along like the what? way. To yeah, like small actions like? So it's small actions for us. Where, so that bias part would be like, where are you feeling at us and them? And asking people just to be like, maybe there's an us and them at this part. And I can I can feel that when I feel it us and them in my body, because I kind of have my shoulders go up, which means I'm getting into a, I used to have a black belt in karate. <laughs> but I used to get like into this like um, fight. And actually there's no fight. The fight is only with yourself. And that stops you then listening to that other person. So it's more little small actions in your in your head. So yeah, there's there's other ones as well to to consider. So. And do you nowadays uh, explain this upfront to people that uh, we have to be asking these questions because otherwise you'll have this tension, or do you just go into the session and apply this? So we do it in a more formal way with the program itself. So we um, get people to over a period of 10, 10 weeks. It's slow change. So it's a very slow change. So you, you can put it into a workshop as small questions to ask people. Um, but if you really just put it into a, a, a more focused, um, everyone can build empathy together. And it gets people to get in the habit of what are they listening to and who are they not listening to as well, which is always a very interesting question because of that, that bias. And it really is a habit of building these habits into a team. Um, you can, as I said, workshop, you can do it small, but you need it over a longer period of time. Mm, yeah, and the longer period of time, I guess reflection plays a big role in that huge huge role so for and what, me what kind of questions been, yeah what kind of questions are have you found to be the most powerful opening valuable in in that reflection it's so if, if i go back to that that here one what are you seeing and what are you not seeing the other one is when it could be when do you feel kind of left out if you're looking at the sea when do you feel included so that's all about belonging and the next part, when you go to that think stage, it's all about really how are you, um, how are you seeing challenge? So how are you seeing challenge? You see it as, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to be involved with that. Or you're seeing it actually challenges opening up different viewpoints. So there's always a choice of how you potentially see things. Um, and when you come to like feel, feel, the questions you can be asking about how is my my emotions and how am I feeling affecting the team? And I've had people come back after that one saying really it's about how am I, how if I am stressed, which 70% of our own stress is caused by ourselves, 30% is externally, which goes to like empathy turning off. If I'm stressed, I pass that on to my team. Um, and then there's enough psychological safety to say i have a need and you have a need so, mm. yeah i'm also curious um what the influence is of the organizational culture because i can imagine that you've seen environments in which this is sort of more accepted or people are more open to this than in other environments can you share a little bit about that the environments um, that are would you would think were more open to this would be the ones that have the support of culture already and they really value and diversity and inclusion. But what I've seen similar is people who, who have environments that are, are more challenging, um, they're also open to this as a, a way which which is really surprising, but they are because they see the need that they really want to prioritize people 
but they just don't know how. It's always been, so how I see it is that um, our organisations um, are really models of our society. And we've been taught for so long that there's a really, there is a winner and there's a loser. And, um, and it's all about status. And that comes back into how organisations are actually designed. And there's just a huge, as from the individuals I speak to, is a huge yearn from, actually, I just want to be seen as a person. I don't want to leave myself at the door when, so I've, I've had a variety of different people come into these cultures who, who have different needs. Um, it could be well-being, they could be wanting to create a better culture and environment, but it's it's really nice to see the breadth and breadth of that. I'm... Um... I'm curious, I, it sounds like this is something you can get better at, you can learn. Um, a key skill that I've heard you talk about is listening and practicing that. What are some of the other skills that you found that you could, for instance, practice on a daily basis that would help you to get closer to this situation? And um, one of the questions I ask myself is, uh, what am I avoiding? And, and that comes back down to who am I not being compassionate with? Who am I not, um, who am I seeing as different to me? And because when I put them barriers up, it's, it really stops me being empathetic. And you really need to have empathy when you are in these challenging situations, because that's when you actually build relationships better and have these moments of trust that are built. Yeah, it sounds like it's easier to have empathy for people who are similar to you, but it's as, so easy. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, so easy. and especially uh, you said uh, resistance. Uh, yeah, that's that's where empathy is the most um, valuable, required, beneficial. That's probably the word mm -hmm. I'm I'm looking for. How long ago have you started with your journey? And if you look back on it. What do you consider sort of the biggest learning from that? I think the Brazilians who I worked with, with the Brazilian design thinkers, they were brilliant in terms of actually you can feel just being yourself with people. So that was the kind of the start and point. Then it came through to, um, as I mentioned, the grasping and letting go of the, the grasp. And I think embracing, now I'm embracing this, uh, awareness agent of how do you just increase awareness you don't have to move towards action because the team is moving towards action together and it's asking like simple questions of what are you aware of have you seen that question and and opening up the choices and open up the possibilities and for me I feel like going through and developing loads of different empathy skills because I've done nonviolent communication gestalt work um and there's so many other practices servant leadership that you just feel, yeah, you can be part of the team, but also you can be serving the team. And that's really a, a really a lovely place to be in. And I've learned to also, I think one's been critical to really um, make sure I'm fully resourced before doing this work. Because as I mentioned, you've got a limit to empathy per day. And you really need to take care of yourself first and that get into a healthy me mindset so you're not stressed. And when you move into that more of a we mindset, it's it's really how can I be best of service to the people around me? And how, how am I impacting that other person? And what is my own um, self-awareness that I need to build to be able to see difference and also to see um, similarities in people? Because both matter. When you see it's too easy to move past similarities or differences because you don't want to see them because someone's different than you. And how, how do you want How do you seek out them different people to see, to build that group that you would work with? And, but how do you see everyone's human needs as a common, common thread of what we're doing? Mm -hmm. I'm now sort of thinking uh, like uh, based on, that it's easy to have uh, empathy for people who are similar like you. If we consider that 
some of the people who are watching and listening right now might be in an environment where they feel that this is less appreciated. What would you say to them? How can they take the first step to create this movement and move forward in a challenging environment? Yeah. Well, I've heard of examples recently um, <laughs> in different large organizations in Portland, and they use the empathy map and they made sure they had that in front of them and they went into a challenging environment and made sure they looked at here, see, feel, think and act in that environment. And afterwards, they felt the conversation had shifted because that person feel heard. So it's a very simple one and everyone's got that map to hand if you're in this environment. Yeah, yeah. So just using our own tools on ourselves and taking, I think that the... the the trick here is is to take the time and do the effort of going through that exercise and writing it down and not uh, uh, just thinking that you know, but making it explicit, right? Yeah, yeah, and saying that I, I really want to listen. I'm not here to talk to you. I'm, I really just want to take that time and I'm here and have that human presence for that other person as well because it's hmm. too easy to be distracted with your phone and and you're just not paying attention. So, yeah. so we had a quick microphone uh, switch, but we're back. And uh, I'm really curious about where you see this heading in the next three years in the design community. How will this influence um, us? So I always see that anyone who's in the design field, who's doing service design or any design thinking work, what I see is that you have an opportunity to move from just focusing really solely on the customer, but to focusing on the whole human experience inside of the organization. And they, I feel that given that there's a humanizing role that we identified in our book, which is we, we come to humanize the actual organization, I see this going to be. And um, and what I see is that this is going to be uh, something that happens in the next three years that we're probably going to humanize a lot more of the HR departments. And that's already happening in, in IBM. Um, they've got a vision to 3.5 and they've got design thinking in there. So that's really worth checking out. And I can give you a link to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I really see them supporting the human experience inside the organization and and this is also uh we're sort of heading towards the end of the conversation but what i find interesting and it's sort of i don't know why just now uh appeared uh, in my mind but uh where it's really hard to be uh, to have empathy for customers when you don't have empathy within the organization uh, so it makes a lot of sense to start within first and then uh also projected towards your customers so yeah yeah i definitely have seen that because um as of myself or any service i've experienced if i feel like i'm just a number in i'm calling up an insurance company i'm just a number they don't care and i often feel this is echoed inside of organizations when I, i've heard so many people just say i am just a number and i'm like you are not a number. You are, if you, when we actually feel that we're a human being inside the organization and we feel that someone is there to support us, we actually start to understand our power, our privilege, and how we're showing up for others. Mm -hmm. we, we've covered a lot of things in a short amount of time. Um, how would you summarize this? What is sort of the the final recap of this conversation for you? Um, for me, it goes back to Avatar. <laughs> and Avatar is really about um, when they, the Navi um, use their introduction, they kind of say, I see you. And that is, not, that is about you not just seeing that person as they are, you're seeing that whole person and taking that time to really understand that, that whole person and I think this will make huge shifts inside of the organizations and how service design practice as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. we need to slow down a bit to go faster later on. That's that's what yeah. I'm getting out of uh, out of your message. 
If people are curious, and I hope they are, and want to learn more, do you have any recommended resources? And is there a way they potentially could get in touch with you to continue this conversation? Yeah, um, so my website is dremmajeffries.com. And uh, I would say there's loads of different resources about empathy. Um, just start to really look into the ones that really connect with you. Um, I can give a, give you a long list to put on the show notes, but um, and because each one has different nuances to how how you do, you could start with language, or you could start with how you feel. They're all different elements of how you could build your own empathy hmm. and increase it. Yeah, uh, we'll make sure to add some resources that get people started uh, with this. Uh, thank you for raising this topic. I think it's. Um, it's really important because, like I said, if you don't start internally, if we're not li even listening to the people who are very close around us at work, nowadays remotely at work, then uh, it's really challenging to start listening to our customers as well. So, uh, Emma, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for sharing this on, uh, on the show and uh, with the Service Design Show audience. Well, thank you for having me and I hope it was helpful for people in the service design industry. I really hope you got something useful out of this conversation with Emma. And if you did, make sure to subscribe to the channel because we bring a new conversation like this every two weeks. So click that subscribe button, make sure you don't miss any new episode. If you know somebody who might be interested in hearing this conversation as well, grab the link and share that with them. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.